from New Zealand about the change in weather there it's going towards spring and I start getting um, colder and more and more irritated I have my little slippers on because it's what 65 degrees here <laughs> 65 or we up to 70 which I can anything under 82 I consider freezing <laughs> um, so here we are and we are going to uh, start the day with Sumaya talking about um, some herbs and stuff. So why don't you join me on the stage? I think we don't even need three chairs. We're going to get rid of the third chair. And you have a whole little um, display here. Why don't we shift places so you can touch your, so you can, you can point at your, wasn't that nice? That was like a dance. That was like a dance. Oh yes, we have these microphones. Oh my goodness. It's official. It's official everybody. Yeah, here, let me put this on you. See, look, it makes you feel important. Better get my hair out of the way. I know, we better get our hairs out of the way. <laughs> Managed to sing the whole first song without it. That's what you'd think after 81 shows, you get these things straightened out. I don't know. I guess that's why the famous people have uh, whole crews. Yeah. Yep. Production. <laughs> it's, yeah. A thing. it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. Uh, I'm pleased to have a couple of people in the audience that helped me. My friend uh, Linda back there was going, was pointing, pointing. She's like pointing at her chest. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! I'm like, what? What is my? Oh, oh! I don't have my microphone now. All right, see, my I want to tell the story that when we first met, do yes. you remember when we first met? I do. We were at a. Um, it was OBJ. OBJ. It was a big music festival, and you had set up a little early. And um, you were doing Thai massage at that time. Mm -hmm. And you traded me a Thai massage for one of my records. You said you'd be willing to trade. And I said, well, I have an album that I made. Would you trade for that? And you were like, well, I don't know. Is it any good? And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the massage that you gave me was really good. It was so amazing. I had never done Thai massage. You lay on the ground. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, did you find the album was all right? I did. I okay, love good. it. With, the, with Fair Trade. <laughs> After all these years, I didn't want no. I love all my friends' music. I think yeah. it's great. Well, we weren't <laughs> friends then, but we are now. Yeah. Um, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about Thai Massage? Do you still do Thai Massage for people? I still do Thai Massage. I've backed off of doing it at festivals, so it's really by appointment only. And I probably don't keep it on the forefront. Um, just because I don't have the space for it, but uh, Thai Massage is amazing. It's assisted yoga. So you get to lay on the mat and just relax while I put you in all the crazy yoga positions. And I just find that, for me personally, I enjoy it so much more than a regular massage where somebody's just squishing your muscles because you're really getting opened and closed and squished in all the right places. And, um, and it's really more energizing. When you get up, you're not kind of like groggy and wanting to fall asleep. You're like, you get up and you're ready to start moving and dancing around. So for me, as a dancer, I love it. It's yeah. The, yeah it's my and so you, if somebody really <laughs> needs a Thai massage, they can get a hold of you. Ah, Sumaya, Gypsy Moon Herbal yes. dot com. That's a place you can get in touch with Sumaya if you uh, want to talk about any of the things we're going to talk about. So. Um, you're this well-rounded individual yes. because you're a dancer. <laughs> what kind of dancer are you? Um, I dance Polynesian and Middle Eastern dance um, with a slight little bit of uh, Spanish influence in there. I can't say that I'm a flamenco dancer, but I definitely have studied some Spanish gypsy style. So. And wait, what came first, the dancing or the or the massaging or the? Herbal? So the dancing came first. Um, it was just something that I was really inspired by. I saw some uh, dancer at, what is it, the Hollow Scream, and she was all snaky, and I was like, I want to move my body like that. And so I started dancing, um, God, it's been so long, I'm not even going to date myself. Um, and then uh, I just started finding the community, and I started learning um, Polynesian style. The teacher that I uh, studied with is Ophelia over in Tampa. And she's an amazing, amazing dancer, and she loves like folkloric styles. So a lot of my base was in folkloric dances from around the world, um, specifically like the Silk Road. And so I have a lot of more tribally folkloric, grounded style based in me. And then I've just kind of expanded on that with Middle Eastern. And where do you where do you dance? <clears throat> I don't dance much as I used to. I <laughs> she doesn't massage, she doesn't dance. What I do you do what she does too. I, I do, I still dance at the um, Hogtown Medieval Fair. <laughs> Yay, Hogtown Medieval Fair. <laughs> it's one of my last standing, you know, at least professional style. Um, yeah, I, I do still dance um, kind of intimately to myself around fire circles, um, especially in the Florida winters where it's perfect to be around a fire dancing. Um, but I have kind of bowed back a little bit on the professional style of dancing and focused more on my henna and my herbals. All right. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> how did you get into henna? So, because of the dancing, uh, somebody had offered me henna one day, and I was like, okay, and I got so obsessed with it, it smelled so good, I'd walk around with my hand on my face like a weirdo. <laughs> and henna, I guess if you don't know, it's a, what is henna? It's an actual plant they mash It's a up. plant, and uh, when you add an acidic, um, like a coffee or tea or uh, lemon juice is what I use, it actually releases the dye content in the leaf, and then it actually stains the layers of the skin for several weeks, um, depending on how long you leave it on the skin, and um, it fades as your skin sheds. So if our skin never shed, it would be a permanent tattoo, but fortunately for us, our skin sheds, so we can keep getting it over and over and over. Yeah, so if you've so. seen like Indian ladies that have mm -hmm. their hands decorated in that brown stain, mm -hmm. that's henna. Yeah, so I got <clears throat> introduced to henna, and I was already in a natural, like a naturalistic state of mind where I was, um, using herbs in my food and teas and things like that and really wanting to you know stay away from anything kind of so uh, anyway so i found henna and it aligned so much so because it was a plant and i'm an artist and i always worked with pen and ink and now i have this plant that's a natural base you know instead of using paint or pen or anything like that like any kind of chemical it was just like this natural product from the earth that i can really share with people and so like I had an absolute die-hard love for it from the beginning. Yeah. There you go. And uh, thank you for drawing on our board <laughs> uh, today. These are these are kind of like traditionally henna-y patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot of different stylizations that kind of get intermixed with everything. This would be a little bit more of like a Middle Eastern 
flow to it, yeah. And so, uh, do Middle Eastern people henna too? I always think of it as... It's a Indian, um, you'll get a lot of like the Indian style because of they're so intricate in their bridal designs. Um, but the Middle Eastern, um, definitely anywhere that there's a large desert climate is where henna really likes to grow. It likes to be dry. The drier the climate, the better the dye. Um, so it's still in that kind of tropical state, but a drier base. Like we can have henna grow here in the winter time. It would be great, but in the summertime during our rainy season, it would just flush out the, the dye content in the plant. And where can, where do you get your, your, your henna? I get it from, uh, Rajasthan. I'm just on. Yeah, okay. I love their stuff. Their different climates give different um, kind of uh, tones of the henna. It only comes in one color. It's kind of like an orange to burnt brown to burnt red burgundy color. But um, so Morocco, you'll get a little bit more red. Um, in uh, India, uh, you'll get a little bit more of a burnt orange color. Yeah, and there's this new thing that I'm seeing at festivals. This black. The black is hopefully jagua, which is a berry that grows in the tropics. Um, but you don't want to get black henna. Black henna actually has PPD, which is a hair dye, and it'll burn your skin if you're sensitive. Um, so the beaches tend to maybe possibly carry black henna. You have to be careful to ask if it's jagua berry or not. <clears throat> and ideally, that would be like a blue, dark blue to maybe blue black, not black. Not black. Not okay. black. All right, so, and you do henna, where do you do henna, different? I was doing henna um, traveling uh, before I had a baby, and so I was traveling up and down the East Coast doing all kinds of music festivals um, and Renaissance festivals, but since I had a baby, I have kind of laid a little lower on the traveling part, so now it's kind of more of a private appointment in some small markets and festivals. All right, so if somebody wanted to, like, uh, I've seen people do their pregnant belly. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. doing bellies. Yeah, so somebody <laughs> could get in touch with you if you, if you wanted. Yeah, I do private henna part, uh, appointments out of golf courts. So. All right, so we've gone through dancing that we don't do too much anymore, and tie that we tie massage that you don't do anymore, and henna that we don't really do anymore. Although you are capable. I still of do. Capable. I still do the henna, just not as abundantly as I was doing it. So now I'm a little bit more diving focused into my herbal studies. Okay, so then you started studying herbs. I've been studying herbs for over a decade. Like I said, I actually was doing herbs before henna, so that's why henna kind of was like a straight shot of awesomeness. Um, but about five years ago, I decided to dive a little bit deeper and actually take a program um, here in St. Pete at Tradition School of Herbal Studies. <clears throat> and um, I thought I was just going to go in there and learn about some herbs and what they do and their actions and properties. but. Um, it turned into being a more clinical program, so now I could actually see people that come in, tell me what's going on with themselves, and we discuss um, options with diet and herbals um, that are formulated specifically for them and their energetics. Okay, now you have brought yeah. uh, some, now you make your own uh -huh. herbal product. product. Yeah. Now, when I think of that herbal uh, school, I think of uh, traditionally Chinese, are they were Chinese um, almost exclusively and uh, then another uh, teacher Renee came in and she started the Western program um, which is a little bit more of uh, you know like your lavender and your basils and your whole, um, the things that you would have in your garden plus you know expansion on that and um, I'm in the Chinese program actually right now because I just have to have endless knowledge of herbs so Okay, and when you get on this program, do you have some sort of certificate? Are you certified as a Yeah, I mean, there is no, like, legal certification um, in herbal studies. Like, you can get a little certificate said you completed a program, um, but there's nothing that recognizes that other than um, the American Herbal Guild. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're certified, but... but yeah. Okay. Uh, now, does anybody actually look that up? Do people? I mean, I hear a lot about herbalists. Do we ever? So the, How do I know if a, how do I know if an herbalist knows anything? The, I mean, can I just set up a booth and call myself an herbalist? <laughs> yes, you can. Okay. Oh, hey, oh, I don't know oh, who that is. Don't do me. I'm you, you, you can be an herbalist because it's your birthright. Uh, you know, like before. I guess the witches of Salem, you know, we all had the right to know our herbs and medicine. Um, but the American Herbalist Guild actually has a program where you have to apply and get approved to be a registered herbalist. And it's only, a, 
acknowledged through the American Guild, but uh, they are kind of like at a top notch where people would go to them and say, oh, these are all these registered herbalists through them, so that is a trusted source. And so that's the only way that you can really get kind of like a certification that's acknowledged. Right, and just because you don't have a certification doesn't mean you're no good, but you could have a certification. Okay, now, <laughs> you, <laughs> you um, are making herbal preparations. Yes. Uh, and then you sell these. Mm -hmm. And so like if I were, uh, let's say my ear's been plugged up for, for two, two months and I come in and I'm like, ah, I've got this problem. This is a friend of mine has this problem. That's why, I'm, not me. I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> So I could, I could call you up and make an appointment mm -hmm. and you would uh, see me mm -hmm. and I would come in and I would tell you my problem yep. and then what would you do? Um, well, we would go through your, kind of your, your case history um, and then I would formulate <clears throat> something that's specific to you and your energetics. Okay, now how do you judge my energetics? Uh, well, there's in like for example in Chinese medicine we take your tongue and pulse like so I would look at your tongue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I would take your pulse and I would kind of determine what that looks like um, in like a Chinese theory and then I would take herbs that are specific for the like for example in your ear having it clogged up there's damp going on in there and so we would want to drain that out and so I would get herbs that are specific for draining damp. Okay. <laughs> Um, you have made some of these prep. What, what sort of preparations do you have here that you've made? So I try to make the things that I sell kind of like a um, like a neutral, like balancing um, energetics. So there's nothing here that hypothetically should throw you off. There are a couple that I would ask questions um, to somebody before they would take them, but mostly it's um, like. They call them adaptogens, so it's kind of like a nutritional wait, wait, base. Wait, say that word again. Adaptogen. Adaptogen. Yeah, so it's like allowing yourself to adapt to stress, kind of allowing the stress levels in yourself, and kind of bringing the nutritional level up into you. So it's bringing it all to a balance is really what we're looking for. <laughs> but some of the things that I have um, are like a sleep aid, because I find that a lot of people have issues with sleep, and so I made one um, for helping people with sleep. I made an adrenal tonic, which is Bomb. I take it. It's huge for me. It's helped me through a lot of stressful situations. Um, and I find that stress is a big factor um, for most people. Uh, I got a rescue uh, respiratory, which um, given our current, current state of affairs, uh, I needed to make something for people. Um, I also have like a five mushroom blend that I actually wild harvest three out of the five mushrooms um, up in the Appalachian Mountains when I travel. Um, and so that's kind of like a rare, I have it when I have it, and then you have to wait for the next. Um, and are your, are your, uh, are these tinctures, would you call it? Mm -hmm. And are they alcohol based? Or? They are um, alcohol and vinegar based and glycerin. Um, I have a whole kitty herbal line for kids, um, which are all glycerin based. Right, because you can extract herbs in either alcohol, vinegar, or glycerin. And honey. And honey. Mm -hmm. Ooh, we like the honey bit. <laughs> so when you're making a preparation, how would you go about doing that? Uh, depends. Uh, you can use both um, dried or fresh herbs. And you would just, uh, I used to do folk method, which would be me filling a jar up with as much herb as I can and then dumping the alcohol, vinegar, et cetera, on top. Yeah, that's um, what we used to do it back yeah. in the day. And I love that method because it's very um, intuitive. But I also love to be able to do it again. So I want to be able to make the same product more than once. So I actually formulate how I want my um, formula to work, and I write it all down in my little um, <clears throat> my little herb book. And I make sure that I have like nine grams of this, ten grams of that, two grams of this, and I put it all together and I write it all out so that I can continue to make it. And that's the scientific method. So it's all equally um, based in this much alcohol to this much herb ratio. Right, and so you put the put the herb in a jar, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and just dump the alcohol or vinegar on top, and you let it sit. For how long do you let it sit? I tend to let mine sit for longer than you need to. It's usually about four to six weeks, is what most people will tell you. Um, I have let mine sit for up to a year, even three, um, just because um, I like that kind of. Folk do they magic. will they out will they no get out? Don't never go bad. They don't go bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And what other little products do you have here? Uh, I also make uh, healing salves. So I have a heal-all salve, I have a muscle road, which is my most popular and I'm out of right now. I have to make more of that. Um, I also have a black pine drawing salve for anybody who works with woods and um, even in the garden and you get little splinters and things stuck into your, and it'll actually pull out the splinter and or um, like bug bites and anything that's kind of stuck in there. And how do you make the salves? I make them, it's so oil as well. Um, so I took all the herbs, put them in um, to a jar and I pour the oil over top of them. I prefer using a heat method because I think it just extracts more of the um, herb constants out of it, so. And then is it is it all oily or is it like a, what, what, te what uh, So the black is nice and black. Oh, look at that, nice and black. So it's more that's, waxy. That's got, um, that's got pine sap that I harvested and it's got charcoal that I harvested as well. Yeah, and sometimes you know, so they So you have good. wax in it mm -hmm. too to make yeah, it, it has like that? beeswax. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. You melt the beeswax. And the beeswax, it? like, it stiffens it up so that you can have a, a nice, smooth, you know, you stick your finger in them. You don't want to stick your finger in these ones. They should have got samples, but. Yeah, these are, oh, well. we're not gonna mess them up. Yeah. We're not gonna mess them up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, okay, so we can come to you. Um, now, is there any, uh, you can just sell us these herbal products without nobody, huh? Nobody cares, huh? Well, you know, <laughs> there's a radar we like to hang out under. <laughs> okay, well, it's good there's to be a, on TV there's talking about There's a certain it, yeah. uh, three letter, you know, acronym oh, yes. the company that yes. likes to push his yes. weight around, so we right. try to just stay under the radar. Right, okay, okay. <laughs> but, um, but if you say it'll, if you say it's good for this, I can come buy it from you if I trust you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I see what's in the what's in the call bottle there. This is fire cider. <gasps> yeah. Fire <laughs> cider. I had to name it my gypsy gypsy fire elixir because there was a whole lawsuit happening where somebody decided that they could um, take the name fire cider and trademark it, um, and so the herbalist community at large fought them because it's been in our. Um, you know, our lineage for years and years and years and years, and there's no right for them to take it. It would be like them saying toilet paper was, you know, trademarked as and their And what's name. in fire cider? Um, you have horseradish, ginger, onion, garlic, lemon, uh, turmeric, rosemary. It's kind of a hot shot. Uh, some hot peppers. I try not to put too many hot peppers in mine because I don't want to blow fire from people's <laughs> mouths. <laughs> and why, why, would I, why would I take fire so cider? It's, Really good um, immune boosting, so if you felt like a cold coming on, you would want to just go ahead and take shots of it, um, and it'll kind of uh, burn it out. Okay, so you don't take that every day. You as can a if you wanted to. <laughs> but, you, know, you might take it if you, you well, felt so, something coming on. So right on. now it's cold, right? So the great thing about fire cider is you would take it to warm your body up. And so right now would be a nice time to just take a shot of it every day because you keep your body nice and warm, keep any type of pathogen that's trying to you know enter we call it um, evil wind in Chinese. <laughs> the evil wind. <laughs> yes, I'm gonna have to sing a song about the wind here later. <laughs> um, now, and I saw that you've been making little gummy bears. I have, they're so fun. Okay, now how, <laughs> how does one make a gummy bear? Um, so I didn't, I have also um, an elderberry uh, syrup, which is kind of a traditional as well as, like just like fire cider is. So it's a traditional recipe that- Elderberry. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Elderberry syrup, so um, it's all over the internet. You could look it up. It's just elderberries, cinnamon, ginger, and really whatever you want to put in it. And I like to um, soup mine up to be really, really active with a lot of other herbs. Um, but uh, I take that elderberry syrup that I make, and then I just add a gelatin um, or an agar powder to it, whether I want to be vegan or not. And, uh, and yeah, I put it in these little gummy bear. <laughs> There's little molds and they come out awesome. I don't know, it's super easy. And, and is elderberry something you want to take regularly as a preventative? Or you can it? take it both regularly as a preventative um, and you can double it up or triple it up when you're sick. Okay. Yeah. Very and good. I have that, like that's what I make for the kids too. I have a, an elder immune so that they can take it, especially when they're you know in flu season and in school and things like that. You can just take like one dropper every day as a preventative, and then if you're sick, you want to take about three to four droppers a day. All right. 
And then what are these little uh, wrapped up things you have here? <clears throat> so I, I tend a little on the spiritual side of my herbal path as well. And so this was, um, we had a storm here. What was it? Uh, e Ita? E-T-A? Yeah. Ida? 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 I don't know uh, <laughs> whatever they want to call it. And so we had a lot of wind here and uh, heavy rains. And one of the juniper trees on my way home, a giant branch had fallen down, so I grabbed it up and I wrapped all of the juniper up. And so a lot of people like to use um, uh, white sage to smudge. Yeah. Um, it's kind of just traditional uh, Native American um, for ceremonies to cleanse before ceremony. But it's also being wiped out due to fires out west and over sold, um, even in like in, here in the United States, um, just as like a cultural hot shot, like it's in every store, like here's your bundle of sage. And so I've tried to raise a little bit more awareness that we have a lot of other herbs that do the same thing. And so juniper or cedar um, both cleanse and clear the space out and offer a level of protection. And so I took this branch that fell and I made a whole bunch of bundles so that, you know, just trying to raise awareness. I know, it is interesting that that podarco, which is a wood that people are burning, mm -hmm. well now they're cutting down all the podarco trees, you know, and that's a bad thing. Yeah. And then uh, I've been seeing recently, well, all these crystal shops, and your crystals are being mined by poor indigenous people, and so you're going into a crystal shop to get some woo-woo crystal. It's like, uh, I just keep moving this because uh, I see your hair rubbing I'm on, the, rubbing on the, <laughs> the microphone. Is there, does anybody out there have any questions they want to ask? Okay, good. We, we, uh, we allow people to ask questions if they want. So I guess, uh, you know, you think you're being all spiritual, and in fact you're being anti-spiritual. So how it's do we know? It's a real big issue, um, and mining the crystals is really, uh, thanks for bringing that up, because I worked with a crystal shop vending um, around the country, and he had these Lemurian crystals, and on the card it said that like the Lemurians buried these crystals in different parts of the world and that these crystals were or the crystals were from different parts of the world and they buried these crystals and then here we are digging them up and selling them and I thought it's the irony of that is like these people buried them for a reason and we're digging them up and buying them you know bringing them to our house and so there's a level of um, awareness that just needs to be brought to the attention of over harvesting um, even with resins uh, like frankincense and myrrh, um, the sage and things like that, is that it gets on these little uh, commercialized trends where everybody wants to buy this up because like the spiritual trend and they think it's a good thing but they're really participating in like the ravishing of all of these. Oh my god, and cashew nuts, we can't eat cashew nuts either. <laughs> it is hard, you know, how do we not? And almonds take, you know, the California has a drought issue and almonds take a lot of that water, you know, it's a so big thing. culture. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's just, it's, a, it's just to be aware of your consumption of certain things. And like pine, for example, we uh, live in a state full of pine, and pine is just as well to be um, burned as, as uh, white sage. And uh, why, uh, why is it that we all believe the white sage is the one that has to be? It's the one that's been marketed the most. Okay. But uh, what, what exactly is it, you're saying it's cleansing here, what exactly is it doing? I think that there's some, there's several levels of things happening with the white sage. Like it's an, um, it's like an antibacterial. So when you're burning it, you're actually like releasing the smoke into the air, which is really on a on a scientific level cleaning the air of like any type of like pathogens floating around. And pine will do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And well. you can burn other herbs. I mean, it's not just cedar and pine and stuff. We can you can burn rosemary. Rosemary does the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, now we know. <laughs> um, are there is there anything else you want to share with us? I don't know. <laughs> anything else you'd like to share with us? Okay. So to uh, to recap, if somebody wants some henna, they can get in touch with you. Mm -hmm. And if they want you to, to do some tribal dancing, <laughs> they can get in touch with you. Yeah. If they want a Thai massage, would you still do a Thai massage? I would, them? and I still, and I beat people with plants as well. You beat them with plants? I beat what them do you with mean? Plants. You beat them with plants. It's kind of like in the same idea of, you know, saging a house and a space. Well, I take the plants and I kind of beat you with them to kind of clear your own energy out of your body. It's like a, it's like a plant bath.
Does it without have the a, water. Does it have a particular name? Olympia. What? Olympia. Oh, Olympia. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Olympia. Olympia is clean, isn't it? Yeah. Clean in uh, some language, yeah. Latin maybe. Spanish. Spanish, mm -hmm. yeah, Olympia. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you so much yes. for taking the time to come and talk with me about these things. And hopefully um, people will, uh, let's see, what, what do we take away from this? We take away uh, uh, that you should look into these things that you're buying. Where do they come from? I guess with everything, I mean, even pineapples. I don't know, it's too hard. I can't do it. Anyways, <laughs> uh, and so, and there you are. We can, you, we can find you at gypsymoonherbal.com. Mm -hmm. And you're living in Gulfport, so people could uh, get in touch with you there and actually make an appointment to come and see you. Yep. Okay. Well, there you go. Thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you for having me. Time. Come in and, and talk to us about that. My lovely, lovely little yeah. setup, and we'll be around. All right. Wow. That's so exciting. Um, ooh. My water. I don't know if it's clean. You know, I run it through a filter, but who knows? Uh, I think I'm going to sing another little song for us today. And I was wondering what song I was going to sing, and, and my friend Linda was here. She's like, do you have any song about the wind? Because it's like, as soon as it gets windy and cold, I'm just like, Rrr. I'm wearing this beautiful hand-knit sweater. Um, and this song is called Fighting the Wind. And actually, my father's father... Uh, sold farm equipment and then um, he sold big farm tractors and then during the Dust Bowl uh, there went that business you know because they had sold these tractors and they were out in the field and everything turned to dust due to lack of care I guess or change of I don't know and anyway so they went broke and, um, because nobody could pay for the equipment and they couldn't there was no point in picking up the equipment and selling it to somebody else because nobody um, nobody wanted it. So, um, so this song is called Fighting the Wind. I said, how you been? He said, fighting the wind, fighting the wind.
uh, to talk about, um, because, I, because of the change in the weather and that I usually go off to New Zealand in the southern hemisphere for the winter, and I'm afraid I won't be able to go because they have their, their borders locked up. Last time I was there, I was making little, uh, little clay people, and somebody said, how come you never showed your little clay people online? And I'm like, well, so anyways, this one's the queen bee larva. There she is. I'm going to hand this to you, uh, Linda, and if you'll pass it in front of both cameras. That's the queen bee larva. She's the only one that actually has um, uh, any glaze on her. And show it in front of the other camera, too, if you'd be so kind to pass it over to Ken to, so he can see it. Uh, the queen bee larva, she has some glaze. There is, there's this lovely frog bass player. He plays the bass. And I don't know, we'll pass him back and forth. There we go. Now, one of the reasons I'm showing you all these people is because there's an art gallery in town called the Brenda McCullen. McMahon. Brenda McMahon, that's it. Brenda McMahon Art Gallery down on the street. And she has a few of my pieces down there for sale along with uh, other things. These ones that I'm showing you here are ones that are not for sale. This one we call Cinderella. Now, oh, what? Oh, down, oh, yeah, down there I have some little penis people. <laughs> but there are also some other ones. Now, these, these don't have any glaze on them at all. They were fired in a wood kiln, and, um, and the wood uh, had some ash on it. Um, there's ash and there's salt, and that's what gives uh, the different colors on these. Um, this one here, this one I call Bobby. My father. This one, this one reminds me of my dad. He was a, a, a Pisces, and so that's my fish sitting on a sitting on a on a fancy um, thing. So when I first started making these little sculptures, I made um, I made this cat, and I said to myself. Well, fine. Here's a here's a cat, but cats are like a 3D printer can make a cat. So that's when I started making these creatures uh, like this fish on a couch because I find cats, you know, just a cat. Any cats can come from anywhere. So I wanted to do something a little more imaginative. Now this cat has a drip on its eye, and this has come from the the, the roof of the kiln. Uh, when the, the salt gets stuck up there, it eventually drips down and it kisses your piece. Now, some people consider these kisses to be like a super boon, like a magical thing, and, and other people don't like them. But this cat, so when I made the cat, I was like, this is boring. Anybody can make a cat. So I put him on a skateboard, mm -hmm. and the fellows in the shop back there at the railway uh, made it so that it actually functions. So we can show that to the, to the world. Um, there we go, this cat, and so those of you, some of you all know that I did get stuck sort of over there in New Zealand for a while, um, and this is, uh, this is a little picture, this is, this is the little boat I made, hoping I'd make it home, and I did make it home, now I'm going to have to make a new boat, uh, hoping I can get there again. Oh, I forgot to give away presents, look, this is for you. So my, I, uh, I want to give you these lovely um, feathers. Thank you. And then over there, there's a little plant. That's um, uh, a hibiscus, <gasps> which you, you know that I, <laughs> Yay! Okay. I, I keep forgetting to give things away. I'm supposed to be giving things away uh, because I like to give things away. All right. Now, moving on. John, will you join <laughs> us? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So if anybody wants to buy a piece of my pottery, I would head down to the, to the gallery down there in Gulfport and see what's available. How are you? Hello, hello. Yay. Welcome. <laughs> um, now, uh, John Milliferris. John Mi Oh, well, we're getting here. We gotta oh, yeah. give you this. Give me a microphone. Oh, golly. See, I don't have any hair to get in the way. Say, so <laughs> I should be good. John Milliferris? Is, 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 that, is that your real name? That is my... Given name? Now name. <laughs> name. Okay, it's really your name now. Okay. Where did you come up with this? Um, uh, no, it just kind of grew on me. It just, yeah. <laughs> You're so funny. Uh, how long have you been wearing your mustache and this little curl? Probably, uh, yeah, end of 2019. I started growing oh, okay. it up. And, uh, 
I'm a sailboat captain as well, so it goes along with the, um, you know. Aye, aye. You want your captain to have a solid mustache. <laughs> oh, I do we. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to know that. Oh, before I forget, I'm going to, you, uh, but you're, I, I've invited you here not as a boat captain, Correct. but as a poet. Yes, ma'am. And so I'm just going to give you your gift ahead of time Woo! so that I don't forget. Thank this you. is a little, it's a little old-fashioned spelling dictionary, and um, it's just full of words. There's no, um, uh, there's, no uh, it's not, there's no definitions, and if you can't spell the word, I'm not sure how you can look <laughs> it up in this book, but I thought that maybe you might enjoy it. it because it is a book, and... Um, and you can, oh, there's some other, uh, oh, there's there's uh, some uh, directions for forming plural, plurals. But I thought that maybe whoever at a loss for words, you could maybe find one in there. And then it would be spelled so correctly. So that's, so that's your gift for taking the time to come here. And I don't know who Barbara is. But, I don't uh, know who she is either. October 3rd of 1978. That was a month before I was born. Okay. And she, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She uh, she was she cared about her spelling. Now I yep. you know I was dyslexic and, and have a horrible time spelling. And when people come and I'm writing their name on the board, people are like you know at Instagram. I'm like yeah yeah how do you spell Instagram? And people like <laughs> roll their eyes at me. But anyways, I don't mind because I will admit it. You can just I talk into my phone. Okay, would you um, like to tell us a bit about poetry? Or who's your favorite poet there that you, I see you brought I up? did bring, um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, why don't we start with this, I'm sure. Um, Kevin McGrath is one of my favorite poets. Uh, he's actually from Chicago, but um, teaches at FIU down in Miami. And um, I'm going to read one of his poems to start off with first. Um, and I have an interesting story how I came across, uh, well, I think it's interesting. Okay, yeah, let's hear it. We yeah. want to hear it. We, we'll judge. Okay, yeah. how yeah. you guys be the judge? We'll we're put gonna, a ten, yeah. tens or zero. Yeah, we'll we're going to judge. Um, okay, guys, get ready to judge, audience. Okay, okay. Um, so, as I'm growing as a poet and, and you know, reading a dearth of, of poems and breaking down poems and trying to understand everything, um, it occurred to me, I was like, you know, I'd love to find a poet that writes in a very similar style, something that I really respect. You know, I've read, of course, you know, the, the Renaissance poets and early American poets like Longfellow and, and Emerson was a, a, a big influence on me. And um, so I kind of threw this thing out in the universe and I was like, I'd like to find a poet that I can, you know, that, that's like very similar to how I'd love to be. And then um, my best friend Riley lives up in South Dakota. And um, he'll be on his walks, walking his dogs to train his dogs. And uh, I'll read him some of my poems that I'm working on. And we laugh because he's like, yeah, I'm probably the only guy in South Dakota who's buddies reading poetry. Um, and so one night he came back from a walk and we were chatting. And he was like, I was on such a beautiful walk today. And he was like, there's a poet out there that could tell you like what I saw. And he's like, I can't tell you how beautiful it was. And he was like, and he described it to me, you know, um, it had snowed and a fresh layer of snow was over everything and the bushes were covered in ice and um, there were little mouse tracks and the birds had made tracks underneath. And he was just like, the, you know, the sound, the, the scenery, and it was just beautiful. And I was like, that's cool. Um, and so uh, one evening I was reading uh, a bunch of prose poems um, and I came across this poem by Campbell McGrath called The Prose Poem. And uh, if you're not familiar with prose poetry, it's more of a uh, almost paragraph form, so it's not going to be your normal rhythm. So. I know, because everybody thinks poetry has to be, you know, roses are red, violets, violets are blue. blue. I love you and you So do you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we're, uh, but prose poetry is more of like a storytelling or a paragraph, like you said. Mm -hmm. so and it counts as poetry, just so you know. It does. And so this is the poem that I read, and maybe, let's see. On the map, it is precise and rectilinear as a chessboard. Though driving past, you would hardly notice it. This boundary line or ragged margin, a shallow swell that cups a simple trickle of water, less real than rivulet, more gully than dell, a tangled ditch grown up throughout with a fearsome assortment of wildflowers and bracken. There is no fence, though here and there a weathered post asserts a former claim, strands of fallen wire taken by the dust. To the left, a cornfield carries into the distance, 
dips and rises to the blue sky, a rolling plain of green and healthy plants aligned in close order, row upon row upon row. To the right, a field of wheat, a field of hay, young grasses breaking the soil, filling their allotted land with the rich, slow-waving spectacle of their grain. As for the farmers, they are, for the most part, indistinguishable. Here the tractor is red, there yellow. Here a pair of dirty hands, there a pair of dirty hands. They are cultivators of the soil. They grow crops by pattern, by acre, by foresight, by habit. What corn is to one, wheat is to the other, and though to some eyes the similarities outweigh the differences, it would be as unthinkable for the second to commence planting corn as for the first to switch over to wheat. What happens in the gully between them is no concern of theirs, they say. So long as the plow stays out, the weeds stay in the ditch where they belong, though anyone would notice the wind soon corn stalks poking up their shaggy ears like young lovers run off into the bushes, and the kinship of these wild grasses with those the farmer cultivates is too obvious to mention. Sage and dun-colored stalks hanging their noble heads, hoarding exotic burrs and seeds, and yet it is neither corn nor wheat that truly flourishes there, nor some jackalopian hybrid of the two. What grows in that place is possessed of a beauty all its own, ramshackle and unexpected, even in winter, when the wind hangs icicles from the skeletons of briars and small tracks cross the snow in search of forgotten grain. In the spring, the little trickle of water swells to welcome frogs and minnows, a muskrat, a family of turtles, nesting doves in the verdant grass. In summer, it is a thoroughfare for raccoons, and opossums, field mice, swallows, and blackbirds, migrating egrets, a passing fox. In autumn, the geese avoid its abundance, seeking out windrows of toppled stalks, fatter grain more quickly discerned, more easily digested. Of those that travel the local road, few pay that fertile hollow any mind. Even those with an eye for what blossoms, vetch and timothy, early for Cynthia, the fatted calf in the fallow field, the rabbit running for cover, the hawk's descent from the lightning struck tree. You've passed this way yourself many times. And can you tell me, if you would, do the formal fields end where the valley begins? Or does everything that surrounds us emerge from its embrace? Ah, poem about a dick. <laughs> Poem about a ditch. They should, yes. re they should rename it. Yes, poem about a ditch. Poem about okay, a so ditch. what got you into writing poetry? Um, at an early age, probably two things. One, um, there was a book in my house called 101 Famous Poems. And it was written in 1921. So in 1921, they were very much uh, in love with um, kind of English Renaissance or uh, English um, poets, and then early American poets like Walt Whitman and Longfellow. Um, and so I read those poems, and, and they, they were educational, insightful, and beautiful to me. And then the movie Dead Poets Society was also a pretty good one. Yeah. Uh, Robin Williams, uh, Ethan Hawke, and um, yeah, I, I was probably, I was an early teenager when that came out, and uh, the, I don't know, just, you know, it resonated. It's Carpe Diem, Live Your Life, and, and Suck Marrow from Life. Of course, I read Thoreau after that, or somewhere in the same time. Henry David Thoreau's Walden, uh, that was one of the things. So I was a little nature boy, and poetry kind of resonated pretty well with Okay, that. will you read us one of yours? We I have was. to keep an eye on our time over there, For so sure. we got to get some of your your poetry <laughs> Let's in jump there. We into can talk, it. Yeah, we can talk more about Let's jump all into sorts of it. things, but we've got to make sure we've read a few of your poems. Gotta find it. Um, did you go to school for poetry writing? I'm an autodidact. A who? <laughs> Self-teaching. <laughs> ah, yeah. There you go. 
autodidact. Oh, I love those words. I wonder if it's in that spelling book. Ooh, look it up. I, well, I'm I, I can't it. because I don't know a how to spell a it. A U T O. A U. I know, it's funny. They're like, uh, spell, look it up. Oh, look, people in the audience can spell. Um, <laughs> so, automobile is probably in here. Oh, authorize. Autograph. Automatic, automatically, automaton, automation, automaton, <laughs> automobile. Ave Maria. Ave Maria, autopsy, those are all in there, but I uh, <laughs> did not see that one. Auto-suggestions. How are we doing on that? Uh, I got it. Um, okay. And I'm going to start with the one I told you I was going to read. Okay. Um, we were discussing the wind and the cold earlier. Well, and you brought up the idea of mantras. Yes. Oh, that's right. My mantra. Just so you know, my mantra is everything's always working out for me. Everything is always working out for me. I say it all the time. And uh, people say you have to envision, you know, what you want in life. And I don't know what I want, but I just want it all to be working out for me. Or things are always working out for me. Like before the show, I always get nervous and I just try and say things were always working out for me. So you're right. That was what we were talking about. How clever of you to remember. Ooh, <laughs> keying in on words. Oh, yes, yeah, keying in the, on words. All that's right. That's the poet's key. Um, so that idea, that one, that mantras have the power to, to reinforce and resonate things for you is an idea that things are going to work out for me, and so I'm not going to worry. Um, even some science is showing that, that your, your body physically will change. Your, the, the way, the frequency your body resonates, uh, your mind can help heal your body. And you can also do the reverse. You can cause yourself pain and disease by, you know, by focusing on negative things. And so it's good to reinforce, like, I'm going to have a good day. Sometimes before I go to bed, I'm like, I'm going to rest well, I'm going to sleep, and I'm going to get up, and I'm going to be super healthy. And I, so that reinforcing mantra, um, and, and the idea came, you know, we were talking about uh, the center at St. Pete Beach, having conversations with people there, um, and, you know, these ideas, like, oh, this mantra, this thing, and, and these, so I was like, you know what, it's come up so many times, I want to see if I can find a, write a poem that says what I think um, about mantras. Okay. And this one. It's called It Becomes Mantra. It becomes mantra, these words I say to myself. It becomes mantra, I have the capacity to amplify my own health. It becomes mantra, I repel the onslaught of negativity that attacks from somewhere else. It becomes mantra, I am discovering the nature of this endeavor. It becomes mantra, neurons that fire together wired together. It becomes mantra. I wield this mechanism to make my life better. It becomes mantra. I am a filament woven into an infinite tapestry of fractal energy. It becomes mantra. My mind is moving molecules to increase my conductivity. It becomes mantra. My human body is energy, resonating in frequency, and I can tune my own frequency. It becomes mantra. I am constructing the temple that is this being. It becomes mantra. I am the architect of my own healing. It becomes mantra. I am radiating love and light. It becomes mantra. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. I am radiating love and light. I am the architect of my own healing. I am constructing the temple that is this being. My human body is energy, resonating in frequency, and I can tune my own frequency. My mind is moving molecules to increase my conductivity. I am a filament, woven into an infinite tapestry of fractal energy. I wield this mechanism to make my life better. Neurons that fire together, wire together. I am discovering the nature of this endeavor. I repel the onslaught of negativity that attacks from somewhere else. I have the capacity to amplify my own health with these words that I say to myself. That's really nice. See, that one sort of feels more poemy, you know, like in the traditional sense, uh, you, know, you know. A little bit more rhyme and uh, imagery in that one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, like I say, because our time is getting short, why don't you go ahead and read another one? I could okay. just ask you lots of questions, but All right, I like let's, it. let's actually 
read some poetry. How are we doing out there in the audience? Good? Okay. They're like, they can, they're, they're, we got some thumbs up, a shrug or two. Um, this is a short one, also very rhythmical or rhymed, uh, called Something Weathered. And it originates from a couple sailing trips that I've done that get pretty heavy out there. And uh, and you get back to the dock and everything's okay. And you're like, that was crazy. So it's called Something Weathered. Head swims in dread as heaving seas back in the dead. Waves bang the hull, thundering in the skull as the heart beats steadily against the dull, lead-faced wall of water's might, the captain and crew as kindred fight to bring the ship home through perilous night. Then rest in a mooring on a sunny day, hugs, kisses, and handshakes on the quay, and smile something weathered, which words cannot say. Aw, yay. That one was a crowd pleaser. Good, good, good. That's All it. right, we have four minutes to go. Okay. Let's have one, another poem. Okay, All right. where do you read? Where can people? I, I met you at the Blueberry Patch reading. Yes, ma'am. That was my first time there. It's yeah. Good, to meet you. good, good. Yeah, it was good to meet. Uh, where else can people hear poems if people were interested in hearing poems? So let's see. Uh, St. Pete's got a good poetry scene going on. Uh, I mentioned the center at St. Pete Beach, so I'll read there every quarter. Um, Going to be coming back to the Blueberry Patch. Uh, you can follow me on uh, Meridian727 on Instagram. Meridian727 on Instagram. So as I become famous someday, you'll be like, I remember that guy. Read in the Laura Shepard show. Over <laughs> That's here. right. Um, yeah, and just random spots downtown that kind of pop up. All right, so. read us another one. Okay, this one's going to switch it up a little bit for you. Because um, I'm also very curious about artificial intelligence, how modernity is changing the human experience. Um, and that's probably what this, this is about. It's called Calling the Bank. At first I thought this phone call was like playing a video game. Like all the old Nintendo games. Complete the level and fight the big boss, Bowser or Dracula. Complete a series of automated inquiries, passwords and riddles, and get to speak with an actual human operator. But then the system let me make my own cheat code access to my coinage for all my far-off quests, administered by the machines, automated tellers, installed at crossroads in some bustling fuel station, commerce hustling down these concrete veins and capillaries of capitalism, and across the atmosphere and space, through walls, these numbers, accounts and balances, through fiber optic cables, pin them. Then I needed new Beskar, a show of credit at the bazaar, and had the AI program cancel and rescind a newly minted cipher token, striped and chipped, expeditiously shipped, magnetized in the empire's order. My voice algorithm syntaxes, suitable to the sentinel, we ended transmission. In the silence, I realized I never spoke to anyone. Oh my goodness, okay. How many, how many minutes do we have? Official timekeeper. Two minutes. You have a two minute poem? I can do we it. We want one more poem. One more poem. Two minutes. Two minutes. This is it. This is going to take us out. All right. This one's called Palmetto, a frequent um, um, what plant that we it's see a, around. Well, yeah, it's a palm tree, isn't it? Well, palmetto, yeah. There's one right there. Yeah, there's one right there. Beautiful. So we'll, we'll homage to Palmetto. Okay. Palmetto is the fern of fireworks the quirky finger trap tree, the gilded garnish of sunshine state dreams. The emerald siren, after slogging miles at sea, to mariners of old, the verdant frame to a port elite. Repose to that clipper anchored in Nassau, the seaborne chariot of commercial conquest, where unconquerable souls sway in turquoise waters at rest. The dark umbrage, on moon-beamed beaches, where romance and innocence reside, with the carnal incantations of lovers and the coming and going of the tide. At Land's End, <clears throat> at Land's End or mine, shipwreck or the ravages of time, when nature has run her course with me, under Palmetto's eternal shadow, I'll dream. Oh, yay! All right, well, that brings us to the end of our.
our show. Thank if you'd you like to uh, support the show, please do. You can become a patron on Patreon. You can send me some money through Venmo. You can leave a tip in the tip jar. And we'll, uh, the next show on the 21st is going to be live from the Unicorn Festival. So don't come here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yay.